Hi, this is Sophie Kravitz with Hackaday. I'm here at South by Southwest in the MIT Media Lab Bio Lounge, and I'm here with Charles Frakia, who is a research assistant and a student at the MIT Media Lab. Hey, thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah, I've, I've followed Hackaday for a long time. I just love it. It's great that we get to meet each other finally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, tell us about some of the kind of work you do. Yeah, so uh, my work really lies at the uh, boundary of uh, biology, computer science, and electronic engineering, largely speaking. Um, I've been advocating for a few years now to try and uh, see what kind of technologies you can uh, you can come up with when you blur the lines between these disciplines. Um, so I'm actually a biologist by training, uh, but I've gone to I, uh, computer science. I, I did a, little, uh, a decent amount of it. I worked at IBM in the past. Um, but also a lot of electronic engineering recently, actually. So I learned a lot of electronic engineering on my own. Um, and I design electronic systems almost on a daily basis now. Largely speaking, I'm, I'm looking at how can electronic uh, technologies uh, really help biological research in the lab or, or biomedical research in general. Um, you, you hear a lot about people doing medical devices. Uh, a few years ago, for example, I, one of my first projects was to do a, an open source uh, uh, ECG monitor um, with, a, with a friend of mine, Adam. Uh, and we, we did that as a kind of first electronic foray. So that was one example. But then we moved more towards the molecular biology, which is where we're, we're from. I'm a synthetic biology, molecular biology person by training. And I'm so, just going to come back to the yeah, ECG sure. because we yeah, actually we, right. we had a, a few minutes to chat last yeah. night about it. And I think people would be really interested in hearing about yeah. what that is and how that works. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it sucks. <laughs> I mean, it was like my first uh, electronic, uh, big electronic project. Uh, and it, it, it's not that great. Um, and actually, that was before the. Now there's a TI chip that does everything that I need to do, and it's like 20 bucks. Oh, really? uh, but at the time, there wasn't, and so we had to do all the analog front end. And uh, I just recently, I'm taking a class on sensors at MIT, and I'm like, oh damn, that's how you're supposed to do the voltage follower uh, uh, for biasing the whole system. And we did it kind of kind of wrong. I mean, it, it still works, but uh, um, but you you have a potentiometer, and you've got to trim it, and you got to like be careful and make sure that your signal is in range whereas we could have designed it differently. So tell us about some of the other combination hardware and biology and computer science projects that you're working on. Sure, so um, uh, recently we've been working on, um, more, more recently we've been working on some uh, um, kind of uh, little temperature and humidity nodes that are designed to actually be packaged uh, in, a, in a test tube, in a biological test tube. And so the idea is that you're able to collect the environmental conditions of your experiment and that helps the, the reproducibility problem in biology. This is one of the major things that I'm looking at is um, there, there have been uh, studies that show that between 75 and 89 percent of all uh, peer-reviewed uh, biological research in certain areas is not reproducible, which is a huge, huge number. Oh, that's totally crazy. Yeah. So does the thing that you're working on, the piece of hardware with the temperature and humidity sensor, does it go inside the test tube with the the, I guess the subject matter? Right. Uh, no, so the, the design for this particular one is actually not that. The idea is to, is to have a proxy. So we, we'd have a, another tube. So if you have a, you often have a series of tubes, like uh, let's say usually if you're doing the, the thing by hand, 10 or 12, right. uh, and then you would just add an extra one that has this little sensor and now you just you just treat it just like if it was a sample. So you put it in a centrifuge, you know, you put it uh, everywhere, uh, you put it in on ice. Uh, if the ice is wet, for example, the thermal conductivity will be different, right? And that will affect your experiment, but right now it's not being measured at all because the hardware just didn't exist. And so we're just making these little examples of hardware and software that, that collect the data out of the experimental uh, um, setup and shuttle it out back to the scientists so that we can, we can start making correlations like, hey, I don't know why, but like this, uh, uh, you, you know, your variance on time uh, for this particular step seems to be associated with success. We don't know why. You as a scientist may, may, may figure out why, but, but you know you can't if you don't have the information, if you don't have the data. And so we're, we're trying to build this, these small little hardware projects um, to, to quantify that context. We have other things like um, uh, pipettes, uh, instrumented pipettes. The pipette is the equivalent of a computer mouse for a, a computer scientist, right? It's like thank you, uh, thank you very much. It, it's like a, it's like a, it's a it's a it's a piece of hardware that allows you to move uh, uh, small amounts of liquids around, uh, very small. How, how small? How small are the liquids? Um, actually, uh, some of the more conventional pipettes out there uh, can do like 200 nanoliters. Yeah, so it's point. So there are ranges. Uh, it's between 0.2 microliters and two microliters, and there's a one from two to 20, and then 20 to uh, uh, 200, and then 200 to 1,000, so one mil. Is a, a pipette a consumable? Is it something that's thrown away after it's used too? 
Uh, no, no, no. The pipette is actually a, a, an expensive piece of equipment. It's uh, usually it's uh, the cheaper ones start at three hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've I've bought pipettes that were eight hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars. Uh, but the innovation in that sector just hasn't been very good. The pipette hasn't changed in like basically thirty years. Precision pipetters, and so we have all, all sorts of like uh, innovations and obviously patents around uh, how to make uh, um, uh, pipettes much more context aware. So one of the things that you and I were talking about yesterday was the Hackaday Prize, which is our engineering competition that what we're asking engineers, scientists, makers, tinkerers to do is to solve any kind of small problem or big problem that's in their community, town, home, whatever. So that's a really big thing. And we asked you about it last night. And I, yeah, why don't you tell our audience about it? Yeah, so, so yesterday we talked about... Uh, uh, in my in my community, let's say in my in biology and biological research and scientific research in general, a one of the major problems that we have is that it's very difficult to do open science. It's very difficult to um, build open systems um, because the incentives just aren't there uh, at the moment. And so one of the things that I often say and I've joked about, and we just talked about, was that uh, you know we're, one of the things I'm looking carefully at is how do you hack the incentives? How do you like really subvert the incentives? Understand how the community and how the environment is structured. Uh, both from the equipment side of things, how do they get their revenue, how do the ultimate scientists actually use that, um, and how can we, in that uh, spectrum of things, build towards a more open and more able set of tools. Because one of the big problems is that it's, in, it's hindering our ability to do uh, science in general. Not having open tools is actually hindering my ability to start doing multivariate correlations across different things. Um, and so. I think about it very carefully, and, and we, we're doing uh, things that we're not announcing yet, but uh, um, but are in that in that space um, where we're thinking about very carefully about how do we move the whole industry toward more open openness, more open science, more open standards, uh, uh, communications, where we we can ask really complex, multivariate scientific questions and answer them much more easily. So. You know, for example, we're, we're standing here in the middle of a room. It's like, um, does the, the flow of air or the temperature or the humidity affect uh, our ability to breathe or whatever? If you're asthmatic, that actually may affect the, or the dust in the air. But that's rarely quantified. Um, that's for human health. But it's the same in biology. It's like in biological research, it, often all these data streams are not collected. And we talked about a second ago about, about the hardware that we're building to try and create these new, new data streams. And so... Uh, so that's really what, what we're preoccupied with, and you know maybe the Hackaday Prize is a nice uh, as a nice place to do that. Um, um, but as I said, yeah, we we we're looking very carefully at how to do open science, how to push the industry towards more openness. So I mean that's a very interesting analogy. I mean I think most of us do think about humidity sensors and temperature sensors and all of this kind of things because it's in our homes and in our environments and. But I never really considered what that's like on a biological level. So you're saying on a cell, uh, cells or biological parts? Yeah, even when you do lab work, just lab work, um, you know, temperature and humidity will affect your experiment in most cases. It's just, but it's it, currently it's it very intractable to follow all of these variables. Uh, it's very difficult. Just the hardware doesn't exist. Um, and, and yet, if you look at hardware, and this is where you know, I'm blending the disciplines a little bit, if you look at hardware and what you know, Hackaday shows almost every day, um, it's not actually that hard to build little sensors that network, that give you information out, that inform, that give you context about your experiment. And that, that's largely speaking what, what I'm talking about here. Yeah. So, so what's it like to be at the Media Lab, which is an amazing place? Um, yeah, the, the media lab is uh, is is an amazing place. I, I uh, for me, it's 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 a place I call uh, kind of home. Um, it, it's a it's a it's a family, really. Um, I think a lot of, of readers actually would 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 echo with uh, with our our culture there. Uh, I can't point to ever, any single thing that is very media lab, but uh, it's kind of a, a underlying algorithm, uh, kind of a. a DNA, what people say, right, uh, for, for being at the Media Lab. Um, often we say that um, Joey, our director, says that it's anti-disciplinary or cross-disciplinary. Um, and that's really what it's about. I think we, we, are, we have a unique opportunity um, with the group of people that we have. We have artists, we have designers, we have hardcore scientists, we have engineers, we have everything. Every walk of life comes in. Um, and, and we have an ability to explore spaces um, that that other places might, or more traditional departments may not be able to. And we have amazing resources to do so. Um, and more importantly, 
at the core of it is this really, I mean, as mentioned, like uh, this kind of hacker culture, this this, this maker uh, culture. Uh, is like, let's just try something. Let's see what what it yields. And, oh, that becomes interesting. And so um, Joey often also, again, the director, the, often talks about navigating with a compass and not with a map. Uh, and so we were like, oh, we're, I'm, I'm interested in, in what biology, electronic engineering, and computer science can do. Uh, we're going in that direction, and what kind of useful things can come out of that? Well, it turns out you can start quantifying the context. Or let's say you're interested in fabrication and biologically inspiring those, those structures. Well, you can head in another direction. There's a group that's doing that. You know, or you can do, how do we do hardcore neuroengineering to really solve the structure of the brain? We also are doing that. So for, for people who are building bioengineering hardware or software or anything, what are some of the challenges in this field? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think um, I often talk about kind of barrier to entry um, um, in that specific space. I mean, there, there are regulations and, and, and you know, I, I do believe that they are there for a reason. Um, but I think it's, a, it's important that we, we build a more uh, thorough intuition, much like the, the open hardware and the open source uh, uh, software movement kind of helped us get our hands dirty and just try. It doesn't mean that that's going to be a commercial product right away, right? Um, but it, it allows you that when you are actually going to try and do that, you can iterate very quickly. You can actually create uh, um, little prototypes uh, quickly. And the fact that a biologist uh, you know, can learn, elect I won't claim that I know electronic engineering, but can learn enough electronic engineering to do an ECG in about like a few months, uh, I think that's kind of interesting it's, it, it, as a process. Um, Am I going to build the best ECG in the world? Probably not. But um, I'm reusing some of these this knowledge to actually build things that are specific to biology that I'm actually um, quite competent in, and that's my, my area of expertise. So it, in a sense, it's, it's, it's getting your hands dirty. I think that's the key, is, is, is having the resources. And hacker spaces provide that. Uh, FabLabs provide that. Uh, you know, um, there are also biohacker spaces that uh, help you provide more biologically uh, relevant uh, uh, tools for that. I think it's, it's, it's really... Just, just do it. Just, 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 just uh, find a space nearby. Uh, uh, do it and, and get um, get your hands dirty. Uh, build hardware. See if it helps. Uh, put it out in the community. Get the good feedback. Iterate on. And you know what? If you're doing something great, um, build a company. Make money out of it. Uh, nobody's gonna be a a angry about that. It, it's it's about the continuum. How to how to help people create more innovation. I think you know it takes all kinds. For people who are just getting started in any kind of biohacking field, are there any good open hardware, open software projects that you can point them to to help them along in getting getting their projects done? Sure. So um, biohacking uh, as a is a, a little bit separate from uh, electronic engineering hacking or, or kind of more common hacker spaces that you see around. Um, there are a number of actually biohacker spaces. Uh, GenSpace in New York is actually one that uh, I worked at for a little bit. Um, it's, it's a wonderful space. There, there's tons around the country. Uh, they're, they're flourishing now, I guess. Um, I think just go there, um, get educated, uh, learn about what you can and, and, and you know what we can do today with the tools today. There are lots of kits out there um, that uh, allow you to get your hands dirty, even in bio. So I saw this project at the NYC Resistor Interactive Show last, uh, just last year, and it was some protozoa. Hopefully I said that right. Yeah and they were being controlled by joysticks. Yep. So I guess in the water, if you push the joystick one way, some ions pushed the protozoa to go in one direction and then you could go in the other direction. I mean, is that a good example of a biohacking project? Yeah, yeah, I think that I, that's actually, that's a great example. I, I'm not familiar with that particular one, uh, but yeah, there, there are tons of uh, organisms that respond to like uh, all sorts of stimuli, and 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 there are kits out there that you can buy to like yeah control protozoa or cockroaches or things like that, um, and it, it's really it's really interesting uh, because it, especially for me because it actually starts blending a lot of the traditional electronics. Uh, uh, hacker space uh, kind of community electronics abilities that we have computer science you know how do you build that app to control these things and then biology as a substrate actually you're actually moving biology so for me this is like my dream come true it's kind of like mixing all those things together um, and and those are great ways to get started um, and then when you when you go further you know you can start building um, things that are more specific even uh, you know individual you can start programming individual cells one of my uh, older projects was uh, actually to um, input uh, or use bacteria to output 
uh, electronic potential that was sensed by a, by a, by a, by a little probe and that was then sent out to like a, um, you know kind of a server and we were, we were just watching the signals live but I had engineered both the biology to sense a particular molecule and then engineered the electronics to actually get this this electronic potential translated out to a web app and so this is kind of the idea. And, and is this something that, like, if I wanted to do this at home, or if somebody wanted to do this at home, is this something that's possible? I mean, how do you even get one cell and get a potential out of that if you're at your house? What kind of equipment would you need? Yeah, so, so it's not, uh, my particular project was not one cell, it was actually a, a, a whole community of cells, so it's a lot easier. One cell, it would be quite hard today, you would need some special sensors. They exist, but they're expensive. Um, you could do that at home. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's doable. You know, you got to check whether you are allowed to. There's a, there's certain places around the world it's not possible. Um, but certainly, it, it is something that is technically feasible and it's becoming easier and easier, um, which is great because it's democratizing the access to all this technology, which is exactly what allowed me to learn electronic engineering, right? I mean, I, I, I learned on an Arduino. I started on, I'm, an, I'm a biologist by training, right? So I learned on an Arduino and now I'm, I'm making these kind of hybrid systems. And, and I think. I think people should be allowed to do the opposite too. Um, learn biology on these these, these simple kits and, 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 and things. So, well, it's definitely pretty inspiring talking to you. Now suddenly I'm like, oh, I want to go get some cells and sure. move them around. That's awesome. Oh. oh my god, do not put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been really inspiring speaking sure. with you. Thanks right. for being with us. This is Charles Fracchia from the MIT Media Lab, and I'm Sophie Kravitz at from Hackaday. Awesome. Thanks. Oh.